Yeah. Post a video from Friday at some point. And then this video. Hey, so we're talking about GIS today and start giving an introduction to that. So, this guy's name is Jon Snow, and he actually is dead. Um, <laughs> And, and he lived in London in the mid-1800s and was an anesthetist and then also interested in disease and how disease spread. So actually in 1954, there was a cholera outbreak in the Soho district of London. And the current idea about how cholera was spread is that it spread through bad air, bad air that was made as organic things were rotting and it would make the air bad and people would breathe that air and they would get cholera. This is kind of before the germ theory of disease and so, I mean, yeah, it's the best we had going. So Jon Snow actually didn't particularly, he had some doubts about that and so in this particular outbreak of cholera, he went and he mapped the instances of cholera deaths in this district and so this is his plot, actually this is a slightly updated version of his plot. His is a little bit harder to follow. But here are all of the, um, the dots of where people lived that died of cholera in that district. And one thing they actually found out here is if you see this X right here, this is a pump, uh, a water pump. And he knows that everything is centered on kind of that pump right there. And I think he already had some ideas that cholera might be spread by water and not in the air. And so he talked with uh, city officials and got the handle removed from that pump and the cholera outbreak subsided. And actually there's a few other pumps here. Um, there is one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one up here, a few up there. But this is a particular one that seems to be centered on that. Uh, so actually later on they found out that this pump was actually dug three feet away from a cesspit. Hmm. Um, you don't know what a cesspit is, it's a pit where essentially, um, a mo imagine our modern day um, septic tanks, but you know, hey, not quite so uh, septic. Anyways. Um, so it was there, and actually in that cesspit was a cloth diaper from a baby that had cholera, and it was leaking into the well. Yeah, this is, this is horrible to think about. Good thing it is early in the morning, and I'm sure you have all the stomach, stomachal gastrointestinal fortitude for this. So uh, that's actually what ended up uh, causing it. But the thing I want to point out here is this is probably one of the first, kind of seen as one of the first instances of the use of epidemiology to figure out what was going on and trying to trace the source of a disease or an outbreak of some kind. This is also one of the first instances of using some sort of geographic information to tell us something about that disease. And so the kind of thing I want to point out to you is that the use of geographic data in some kind of systemized way and the birth of epidemiology go hand in hand. These are two things that were essentially born together and, and have been used closely ever since. And that's kind of what I'm going to lead you in today is geographic information systems or the modern way in which we are looking at defining kind of um, trying to manage and analyze geographic or any kind of spatial data. So GIS is a system designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and present all types of spatial or geographic now one thing I do want to point out here is that, yes, geographic information systems is in the name, and oftentimes it is used for geographic information, something that is actually on the Earth's surface. But that being said, it's also used for a lot of applications that are spatial, but not necessarily geographic in nature. So that, that's uh, where we're going there. And the thing, the place that GIS really excels, where it really does great, is in uniting multiple kinds of data from multiple sources. And so if we're just doing like one kind of data type, like what we were doing last week, we can do that in simple statistical programs like R or something like that, and we can get information about spatial distributions of things and, and cool
cool stuff like that. Where those kind of programs start to flounder, I actually don't do so as as well, is when we start joining many, many different kinds of data together, and, and those start losing their power, whereas <coughs> geographic information systems really sees the it's flourishing where we have many different lines of data, and we're trying to synthesize those into answering one question or something like that. Now, all GIRS, G, uh, big DAS, my tongue hasn't woken up yet. All GIS operates on some common principles. And, and that's really what we're going to be talking about to, uh, throughout this. I'm not going to be honing in too much on, on the, I'm going to try as little as I can to give you um, the theoretical concepts and kind of the broad strokes of how GIS operates so that if you were to try to use it in any platform after this, it'll all be essentially applicable, um, but maybe not uh, exact. So, um, and another thing here is that GIS actually goes well beyond biology. In fact, biology, several uh, fields of biology use this quite a bit, but that being said, uh, GIS is used for like everything. Um, if you look at when Myra Street was, well, were you guys here before the like Myra extension was here that goes to the highway and you had to like go weird ways around to get to the highway? When that was put in, it very likely was decided where exactly that was going using GIS. So it's used in city planning and transportation planning all the time. This is used in geology all the time. This is used in essentially every field. There's very few fields that, that GIS is not influenced. So this is not just really a biological computing topic, but just any sort of, of data analysis that has any sort of geographic component, which is most of it, uses GIS. The other really interesting thing about GIS, and I think this is still the case, is that it's a, really, it's a skill being able to use GIS that's in high demand, and there's actually not tons of people that are well trained in GIS. To give you an example of this, when I was getting done with my undergraduate degree in 2006, um, I, I, I was accepted to the master's program here and, was, and that's what I was going to do. But I had been working actually for the last three years for the US Forest Service and one of the things I did was manage GI some, I was working on projects in which I was using a lot of GIS and so I kind of through the Forest Service had gotten trained in to do that. Actually, as I was graduating, I got two unprompted job offers to do GIS, just kind of out of the blue. And and the major reason for that was not that like I was particularly amazing or anything else, it's just that it was so, and I think this is still the case, but there's just so few people that are well-trained in GIS that, that anyone that has any experience in it kind of becomes fairly high demand, yeah. How, how long do you think it takes to get good enough at this? To, or like how good do you have to be at this to get a job at Back then, so um, I don't think it actually take you all that long, especially for someone that's slightly, com like even slightly computer inclined. Um, not, not actually all that long. You could probably be in You, you could probably take a like like a week long intensive and, and be pretty on par. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, looking for a job? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't everybody? Um, yeah. So uh, just again, let you know. Yeah, one of them was actually working at at uh, Forrester Research Lab down in Pendleton. Uh, after this is one guy that I'd actually been working with a little bit already. Uh, He's like, hey, I got this grant for the next five years. You want to come work for me? I was like, yeah, I'm going to grad school. And then randomly, I was at a conference in Orlando presenting um, some stuff. Actually, this was like the next year, 2007. I had done some research on my master's. I was at a conference presenting some of my data. I get this random call, and it was from a, uh, a contractor that was going to take over um, GIS stuff for um, the Forest Service during fires. So they were going to contract all the GIS work for the Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest for fires. And yeah, they, they 
called me up and offered me a job on like just on the phone call. It was a little weird. And I was still like, I'm gonna stick with my master's. I don't know. So yeah, so that's 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 kinda nice. So just kind of letting you know that actually this is this is a skill I'm kind of by demand. Uh, the places that's kind of used, kind of used, is used, I should say kind of all the time. Um, GIS is used really extensively in conservation and ecology and other fields like this. This is something that gets, it's, it's, I mean, this, in these areas, it's really prevalent. It does, th uh, we use it for things like uh, keeping track of wildlife tracking data, how do we compile and manage that. Uh, range prediction of species, we, we can use this to model where would we, based on what we know about where species exist, and combining that, again, this is taking really, excuse me, exercising the power of GIS, taking where we know animals who exist right now, and then also taking other data such as, what's the temperature in these areas, what's the vegetation cover in these areas, what is the elevation, what is like the slope and aspect of the terrain, how steep is it, taking all these different factors and predicting then where should animals exist based on what we know of the physical and biological communities that are there and the information that we already have about where those species are and we can make really good range predictions based on that. In fact, if you open up uh, one particular thing, it's called the um, gap analysis. There's a Washington gap analysis, there's a Oregon gap analysis, but essentially what it does is you open up this book and it has like every single like vertebrate species that occurs. I have one for Oregon, it's like this thick. And it has like one page for every vertebrate that we know to exist in those states. And then for every single one, it has these really detailed maps of where they should exist, like like really down to the individual drainage. And it's, it, it's like, we did not go out and survey all of those places. We don't actually know for certain that they exist in all those places. What we did was we took all the data about where we know these organisms to exist and extrapolated based on all these other parameters where should they exist. And again, like I said, this is really taking advantage of what uh, GIS does best, Take bringing together many, many lines of, of uh, data and synthesizing it to answer some, some questions. Uh, also doing this, we can prioritize habitat recovery areas, identify biodiversity hotspots, and a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's just to give you a sampling. And again, like I was talking about earlier, how this and epidemiology were kind of born together. It's still used a lot in public health and epidemiology. And so, for instance, uh, we identify areas of increased uh, incidence of a disease, predict where a disease might uh, spread next, track the spatial progression of a disease in a population, uh, and identify correlates of disease based on spatial information. Again, bringing together lots of sources of data to try to, to make predictive um, answers to things, and, and on and on. To give you some examples, you've probably seen these sort of things a lot, but uh, maps like this, heart disease death rates, 2004, 2000, uh, 2000 and 2004. Uh, I think the takeaway message from this is don't live in the South. Um, <laughs> but this 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 was compiled probably using uh, GIS. This is another one and it's kind of washed out. But what this is giving you is uh, colorectal cancer incidence and mortality rates. And so the instances are in in the shading in the counties, and then the death rates are actually in the the bubbles that are inside there. It also has data plot up there of um, uh, federally qualified health centers. I don't know for what, but yeah, that's probably also generated. Now those those are those are like fancy maps and kind of cool maps, and, and that's kind of the more visual thing that you can generate from GIS. But this isn't necessarily highlighting the the best analytical uh, stuff that we have from GIS. Now, all that being said, all this has been geographic so far, and it, like I was saying before, it's both spatial and geographic, so we're not limited to geographic stuff. So just, I, I really briefly, last time I was putting this together, grabbed a handful of, of articles that are using GIS in medicine, but mapping not geographic uh, spatial things, but, but spatial things in an organism. So for instance, uh, using GIS to, to map rectal lesions. That sounds fun. Um, using GIS to, to evaluate 
uh, canine extruded disc herniation. And then distribution and clustering of intramuscular fat, the muscles of the rotator cuff. And spatial modeling of colonic lesions with GIS. So again, anything that you can now project into two dimensions somehow, you can use GIS to spatially analyze how that process is occurring. So we can do this with things inside your body as well. Like for instance, I was looking at these, uh, both the colonic one, the rectal lesions one, essentially they take the tube, the inner tube that is the colon and project it as if it were flat. Um, and then are mapping the occurrences then of lesions within there and looking for patterns within that. So this is interesting. So with that, let's talk a little bit then about what the scope of what I'm going to talk about here. So first off, I really want to talk about the commonalities in GIS. And so that the information that you're going to be getting from this week of lectures is going to be generalizable to all of GIS and not just one particular program that I'm going to be using. Now all that being said, what we're using here is not the dominantly used software. Pretty much up until this point, everything that had you use is the dominant software that is used for that. Like R, that is the dominant analysis for almost everything that, or the program that is the dominant analysis for everything I've had you do for it so far. Image J, there is nothing really that competes with Image J. These are the dominant programs for using those. That being said, GIS, I will not be having you use the um, that. Uh, Esri makes this product called ArcGIS. Someone told me back in 2005 I should buy a stock in Esri because it's actually a GIS person because they're taking over the world and they kind of did. Um, this is the dominant software for GIS um, really in the world. They have somewhere in the neighborhood of 43% of the market share. The next, the next one down, the next product down has like 11%. However, there's a couple things that, that make me cringe about that. Number one, it's expensive. It costs us tens of thousands of dollars to get site license to ArcGIS here. Yeah, we're not doing that. Um, and then also it's proprietary. So I talked earlier on about my ideals about how software works and should work in, in, in science. And honestly, ArcGIS doesn't really. So all that being said, we are going to use an open source GIS application. Actually, what we are using probably after ArcGIS is used as much as anything, between that and another one called GrassGIS. The other thing that's going to happen here is that GIS data is generally stored in relational databases. Uh, these relational databases most commonly are um, format Postgres. Uh, this thing right here is generally just pronounced Postgres or PostGIS or occasionally SQL or SQL, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, but more commonly those first two. Now, I, I will delve into relational databases a little bit, but not a ton. And the reason for that is that's like a whole nother can of worms. And you can kind of get by okay and understand the concepts of GIS and understand what's going on here without really understanding what's going on with relational databases. However, that being said, if this is something that you want to pursue after this point, understanding how to work in relational databases is what really unlocks the full power of GIS. Um, but that being said, it, to really pull those in and how, how you, you unlock those and work with those is, would be a little bit more time than I really have set aside for this. So that we won't delve into a lot. Besides, uh, it would be another, it would be a little bit more of a, a language for you guys to learn. And, yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the kinds of data that we have in GIS. And the major kinds of data that we have is raster data and vector data. And actually, these are going to be very similar to raster images and vector images that we were talking about earlier uh, when we were talking about image analysis. Really, uh, and that's kind of one of the interesting things about talking about GIS is it's getting into kind of the, the nice marriage between the image analysis that we were doing two weeks ago and the spatial analysis that we were doing last week. Uh, so you have those two, and then also we have lots of property tables that then can assign uh, data and information to things that are spatially mapped here. So raster and vector data are going to have a spatial component to them. 
Uh, property tables will generally not directly have a spatial component to them, but then they will be generally connected to either the raster or the vector data through some sort of ID that then connects them and assigns values to the objects that we have in these two types of data. So, that might have been a little bit quick through that, but I'm going to go through each of these data types, explain them a little bit more, and we'll kind of expand on that. So let's start off with raster data. And with raster data, this is essentially exactly the same kind of thing that we've been talking about in image analysis, like a raster image where it's made up of a grid of pixels, and each of those pixels then has some sort of values assigned to it, generally values in several different, for instance, in color folds, several different uh, color channels, and then we have a 0 to 255, uh, so 8 bits of information assigned to each of those color channels, and we make an image with that. And it's exactly the same thing here. And generally, and a lot of the, the raster data is actually just traditional uh, digital imagery. So in the format of like a JPEG or a TIFF or something else like that. It's really not all that foreign. And then all of this has been what's called georectified. Now georectified is to take and apply a coordinate system to that image so that it can be correlated to geographic data. So the result of this then is that each pixel is now mapped to some geographic location. Every pixel then like maps to some place on in, in spatial space. Now most of them in geographic some place on the Earth or some place on the Moon or Mars if you're doing that or in the other case uh, of, of doing something like for instance in the human body some, some uh, repeatable location in a human body. And then we have pixels there. Now all that being said, these pixel values are not always visible. Like oftentimes they are. Oftentimes they are just images taken from a plane or taken from a satellite or something like that. But sometimes also we use other color channels as well. For instance, a common one that is used is that we use uh, imagery made in infrared, which is very helpful. Or this can actually be calculated data. These rasters are not always taken from actual imagery at all. Oftentimes they're actually created using calculations that we make at each of these geographic locations and, and add that on. So several different sources of raster data that we get. Uh, one of the most common ones is satellite and aerial imagery. If you've dropped yourself into Google Earth and kind of cruised around and, and turned on the, the satellite layer, this is what you're very familiar with. And this is what's also known as remote sensing data, which is just any sort of data that's collected where the, the sensor is not physically in contact with the, the surface that you're sensing. That's hopefully straightforward. And this can also be in visible light, and also oftentimes that's called true color imagery, although that's a little misleading. Or it can be in some non-visible spectral bands, and that's often called false color imagery. Also, we can have things like thematic images, which are not necessarily imagery like, like photography at all, but this can be things such as uh, solar uh, geology type, of a particular geographic area or political boundaries or other things like that. So let's talk a little bit about some of the common spectral bands that are used in a lot of this imagery. And the first one, just true color, which has a red, green, blue channel, something that you're hopefully familiar with after we talked about the image analysis. It's kind of the exact same thing that we've seen there. Another one that's really commonly used is red, or green, red, and near infrared. Now this is kind of nice. It, it maps the near infrared to the red channel. And near infrared is really nice because actually vegetation is really reflective in near infrared. And so what this means is that vegetation, or at least vegetation that is currently photosynthetically active, I should more specifically say chlorophyll is very reflective in the near infrared. Um, is, is going to show up, and since we're assigning it to the red channel, it's going to show up red. Which kind of looks weird, but 
it is really easy to see. So actively photosynthesizing chlorophyll-filled vegetation appears bright red. And then we assign the green channel to blue and the red channel and all reds to the green channel, which comes out a little funky, but it is. Also, there's another one uh, that's commonly used, which is blue near infrared um, and mid-range infrared. The blue channel is just blue, actually blue. And so this is nice because your water stays blue, and that's kind of makes sense. You look and you expect water to be blue, not soil to be blue, so that's, that's useful. And then we're using green channel is we're assigning to the near infrared, which is also really good because this is intuitive. It means that vegetation shows up green. Again, makes sense. And then uh, the mid-range in infrared is assigned to the red channel, generally, and here this gives you some ideas about, um, so, so mid-range infrared gives you, is soil has different reflectivities in the mid-range infrared based on its, and its water content, so you get water content data on the base of soil based on this, this, what would be red channel in there. So let me give you a couple examples of this. This is a green, red, near infrared image, and this is a farmland. And what you can see here is that we have all these bright red kind of patches through here. That is vegetated areas where there's lots of nice green growing things. And then there's lots of places where it's not so green. I don't know why. So this is really good for mapping uh, actively growing vegetation and then also is really good for plotting changes in that because this uh, we're applying this to a channel and it shows up really distinctly from everything else we can really easily monitor changes in vegetation over time with, with uh, the green red and near infrared if you look at the blue oh that doesn't show up too well blue near infrared and mid rate infrared what you can see here actually is if you can see it actually, it actually kind of looks like a freaked out uh, normal picture. On that last picture, yeah. was that just the, um, the infrared channel masked over norm, normal image? No. Okay, is it, so the parts in this that are green were red in the original image? Red-ish, had red tone. So actually probably they were coming out, because you actually have a decent amount of green and red in there, they were probably more yellow. And so you're, you're, you're seeing now there's an element of green and red in there. And then, yeah. Okay, how about? Yes. Yeah. So I'm guessing, actually, my, my guess is this was taken in kind of like a late summer, early fall. Um, why don't you come back there? Thank you. Um, yeah, where you have a lot of fields that are kind of been harvested, and then there's not too many that are still actually actively growing. That's my guess, by the way. Because the green is what was red, and the um, go back to that. what was blue is now green. So things that are green show up blue. So if you have greenishness that was not necessarily chlorophyll, then that is being assigned to blue. So things that are appearing bluish actually were greenish. So like the the pond. Is Yeah. So you have kind of a bluish cast there, probably was kind of greenish, probably something like this. Kind of greenish. Fun, isn't it? I used to look at these things with the horses every once in a while. Like they have stacks and stacks and stacks of these. And mostly it's in it's in this. Which the first time you look at them like just kind of wigs you out. Like you see places that like you know and you're like, what? So this is a blue near infrared, uh, mid range infrared, and if you can see a little better, it actually looks fairly normal. Uh, like it looks like it's just been uh, like oversaturated or something kind of weird like that. But you have blues being like their actual channel that actually was blue, and then you get some information about soil water content as you look at the reds, 
And then as you see grains through here, that's actually just vegetation. But one thing you will notice is that vegetation does not stand out nearly as well as in the green, red, near infrared. So they're used, this gives you more information, like different channels of information, because each of those is mapping to something kind of really interesting. But the vegeta if you're just interested in vegetation, it actually doesn't give you nearly the interesting, the great stuff that that does. Why, why, do you, why does this look so washed out? Because of the connection between my laptop and that. Oh, if you look at this, oh, it looks nicer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there was green on there. It is not a desert. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, let's come around and do this for everyone. <laughs> Which reminds me of like, when I was like in kindergarten, the teacher would be reading a book and had a picture in it, like, and let's show you all the children. <laughs> and then Christopher Robin should come. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about vector data now. Hey, they're my tanks. Hey, look at that. Cool. Because, yeah, you guys failed to get ice spotted, didn't you? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's too bad. Okay, so vector data now is, we've talked about this a little bit before. I said I'd mention it and come up again at some point. This is really similar. Or in, in principle, vector data here is very similar to vector images. We're really, we just have a series of points that may be joined or may not be joined. It depends on, on the type of uh, thing that we're doing with them. And each vector object is going to have some sort of unique ID to it. Um, and sometimes those are assigned a little bit differently depending on what kind of GIS system that you're in at that point. But what this does is this allows all the vector objects then to be uh, attached to data that is in other database tables. I mean, this is really how we're exploiting kind of the full power of GIS, is being able to take these, these vector data that are mapped in spatial area and then apply them to other data. Like we can apply them to population or instance of disease or, or vegetation cover, or any of these other things. We can, we can apply that data to this and have kind of join the spatial with the not spatial. The other really nice thing about this is this means that it's actually, this makes this really easy if you get data from other sources that did not come from like a GIS uh, system, which I just realized was kind of redundant, didn't come from GIS, you can associate that with the data that you have in GIS really easily as long as you can join that through this unique ID, which actually isn't too incredibly hard. So like for instance, if I found a table of something in Wikipedia of, of data for like all these states or all these counties or wherever you happen to find that, that's not actually spatially, um, it gives you names of places, but it's not necessarily spatially um, kind of uh, tagged yet. And doing that in GIS is relatively easy because of this system here, because we're using these relational databases. And there's really three types of vector data that are used in uh, GIS. There are point data, there is line data, and then there are polygon data. So let's go through each of these uh, sequentially. First off, we have points which are only points. I guess that's kind of intuitive. And these can be things like occurrence of events, occurrence of organisms, anything that we can describe by a single point. Which this is, we've kind of talked about this already in spatial analysis, and you kind of have hopefully a good idea of what kind of things we can describe by points already. And, and they have really one attribute to them. They have a location. They have this x, y coordinate that pings them in, in space. And that's really it for them. Of course, again, they're going to have that unique ID so we can attach lots of other data to them. But intrinsically, they only have that one attribute. Then we have lines. Uh, these are just a series of points that are joined in some specific order. And so for, an ex I mean, for instance, this could be things like streams, roads, power lines, borders, um, trails, um, blood vessels, anything that you can describe as something linear can be uh, described as line or line type vector data. 
And just here we have vertices stored as an xy coordinates, and then we have some kind of storage that, that tells us in which order are they joined, which order are they um, uh, put together. And now this has an additional attribute. We, so we still have these points in space that have their individual locations. But here we also have another attribute, which is a length. A length of that entire line is also now another intrinsic attribute that we have. And finally, we also have polygons. 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 Ah. Excuse me. And these are a series of points, and they're joined, but now instead of being joined in order, they're still in order, but they're joined in a circuit so that they form some complete shape. And again, these vertices are stored by uh, xy coordinates, and again, we are storing them in some particular order, so there's order to these points. And again, this can be political boundaries, this can be things like species range, other things like that. And this has another attribute. So we have kind of a length attribute, which is called perimeter, which is very analogous to length in the line points or the line type data. But we also have an area. So each of these polygons has an area as well. So now we have a point in space, a length to it, and an area. Are there any questions on those uh, vector data types? Okay, so we'll leave data types for a moment. We also have, I didn't really talk too much about the uh, 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 property tables, but we'll come back to those at some point. But for now, I want to talk about some, some basic fundamental uh, ideas about mapping in general and GIS in particular. And one of these is that we have to have some sort of projection or some sort of, and some sort of coordinate system. And it turns out, in case you did not realize this, the Earth is not flat, which causes some problems for mapping it on a flat surface. It turns out, indeed, the Earth is three-dimensional. It's round, roundish. Uh, however, that being said, when we map things on the Earth, we tend to be mapping them in two dimensions, unless we're using a globe. And which is really hard to use globes on the Earth. Maybe we'll get to that point where everything's just rounded mapping. But what means, this means is that we're representing a 3D Earth and a 2D projection, which also means, intrinsically, there will always be distortions. Every kind of projection system is intrinsically distorted because we're not in three-dimensional space anymore. However, that being said, it's how do we minimize the amount of distortion that occurs. We also then have a coordinate system, uh, and this is how points are designated in a given projection. I guess we should go back, yeah. So, did I make that clear? I kind of went over this fast. That projection then is the process of taking this three-dimensional structure and, and, and plotting it on, on two dimensions. That is the process of projection, and there are different methods of and then the coordinate system is how we designate points onto that projected surface. Is that, okay. And there's a couple commonly used ones. Uh, the Mercator projection with the latitude longitude coordinate system. This is really common. Um, it's also really distorted, especially as you go towards the poles. Talk about that. We also have this one called Universal Transverse Mercator, which is both describes the projection system and also the coordinates system that we have in there. Um, actually, this one's kind of nice. It works at smaller, essentially, it takes the entire Earth and it divides it up into, I think, 60 kind of slices, and then each of those slices into several boxes, north and south. So you get all these boxes, and then you have a different, slightly different coordinate system for each of those boxes. Now here's the nice thing about UTM. So in each of those boxes, you're only having a coordinate system for this very localized area, but then that coordinate system is in meters. It's X and Y in meters. So if I give you a UTM coordinate, 
And I give you another UTM for it. It's really easy to calculate what the difference is between those or the distances or how you get from one to the other because this is just X meters and Y meters and it's really easy. Uh, however, that being said, it does not work because we have done it this way and made all these square blocks. It doesn't work universally over the entire Earth in the same coordinate system, so you have to break it up. And it looks actually like this. So these are all the individual blocks in which have their own coordinate system. And each of these then are labeled. So we have a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, blah, 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 all the way up to like 60. And then we have letters going from A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, 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 all the way up to X. And so each, each coordinate is then, or each section is delineated by, you have your, your number and your, your letter. And so right now we are in UTM 11T. And then usually then you have some numbers that are the X and Y uh, coordinates after that. This is really useful for, like, if you have very localized projects, like if you were working on a stream restoration here in Walla Walla County or something else like that. It works really well to use UTM because a very understandable, very sensical uh, one to use at those spatial limits, but not necessarily if I'm trying to coordinate, like, things across the globe, it doesn't work so well. And then we have Mercator projection. Uh, that gets very, it is global, and you have latitude and longitude is often the coordinate, sy coordinate system assigned to that, but the problem is that you have fairly major distortions as you get away from the equator. So like Greenland's like the size of Africa and way bigger than Australia, even though Greenland is like a third the size of Australia. But again, I'm sure you've probably heard about that a little bit before. Okay. Let's talk about the map data. This is another thing that, that you can get. Another place where everything can go wrong when you're mapping things. And it actually turns out that the Earth is not a sphere. And actually it's not even an oblate spheroid. It's, it, it, it doesn't even like really follow that. It's more irregular than that. Or ellipsoid or whatever. It, it's fairly Irregular and actually just the shape that we call it now is the geoid. It's 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 its <laughs> own shape <laughs> Which is not and it, this is affected by the composition of the earth and the local gravity So you actually get bulges in places and depressions in other places again. These are really minor But but it's not perfectly round. It's just kind of lumpy and what this means is that when you're projecting what shape you assume the Earth is. So we're going from this three-dimensional projection to a two-dimensional projection. And it matters what shape you assume the Earth originally is when you go from one projection to another. Because again, all of these projection processes have distortions. And so depending on how what shape you assume the Earth is, is going to distort slightly differently. And so what you use is you actually do not use the exact right shape of the Earth, really ever, when you make a coordinate system. What you do is you use what's called a reference ellipsoid, which is an approximation of what the Earth looks like, kind of, sort of. And this approximation that you start with affects how your coordinate system is laid out, again, subtly. Not, not If you were to look at the whole Earth and look at two uh, different reference ellipsoids, you would not be able to tell the difference. But if you're looking for something with a GPS, it does make a difference. And so whatever approximation of the Earth you're using, or you start with, means that you use what's called a different map datum, or essentially a way of laying out those coordinates that are intrinsic to that reference ellipsoid. And so there's actually quite a few of them. Uh, the common ones that are used in this area, uh, the World Geodetic System 1984, which is often called just WGS84, is the one that's currently used most commonly. This is like the default. If you pull out a GPS and you start using it, the map down is by default using is WGS84. Another one that's commonly used is also North America datum 1983. It actually turns out that, so some of the different reasons, well, why use different map datums? Well, 
we've been increasing in accuracy over history of, a, of, of modeling the surface of the Earth, which means that we get better accuracy and more regularity with our map deck datums as we update them to, to reflect the actual shape of the Earth. And then also, some are locally more accurate than others. So the Earth is distorted differently in different places. It's lumpy in different ways in different places. And so the distortions are either more or less exaggerated in different places. And so if you use a slightly different map datum in different areas, you get better results. So for instance, North American datum actually works better in North America than WGS84. WGS84 works really well globally. Globe wide is really good average between distortions everywhere, but actually NAD83 works really well in North America. So you see these both commonly used. A uh, little side story I actually, I was using, <laughs> one time working for the Forest Service, I was, I was using this and entering coordinates from NAD83 because Forest Service often uses this because it's more accurate. I was taking those coordinates and entering them into a GPS and then trying to go find those. There was previous uh, survey plots in those areas, and I was trying to find them again. There's markers on trees. I was trying to find those trees in the forest using the GPS. I just <coughs> punch them in. But being young and naive, I was a sophomore in college at the time. I didn't understand that actually the GPS was working in this. I was entering coordinates in this. And it actually ended up I was, I was getting like two to 300 meters off, which if you look at the whole earth, that's tiny. That's nothing. But when you're looking for an individual tree in the forest, that's huge. <laughs> that's like a fifth of a kilometer. And I just go like trouncing around for the entire day. And it wasn't until the next year that I figured out what happened. <laughs> it was so nice being able to like just follow my GPS like right to the tree. Hey, there it is. Um, it was so much better. So anyways, uh, which map datum you use, like if you look at the entire earth, not a big deal trying to find something or trying to map things, really big deal. If you're trying to drive your car down a street and you're in the wrong map data, which luckily all those, those things are integrated in most GPSs you don't have to worry about. It. And then, and then, so some are locally more accurate, some are, who knows why people are using them, like the Chinese actually have an encrypted map, map data. I actually don't exactly know why. And then there's this concept of called datum shift. This is the last thing before I let you go. Sorry, it's taking a little bit long. But this is just the distance between the same coordinate and two different datum. So like this can be from, it could be exactly the same to hundreds of meters apart. That, that was my problem. My datum shift was like smacking me. Anyways, um, yeah. So that, that's all. Are there any questions? Yes? Is the datum shift usually a linear relationship or is it like totally not? No. It's not linear. Because again, the Earth is lumpy, and so like yeah. like in reality, it, it yeah, it, it, it's different all over the place. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Enjoy your day, and I will see you on Wednesday. And we'll talk more specifics about actual using of GIS. Oh, and I'm a little bit behind about getting assessments up, so you should see an assessment go up this afternoon, and then another one probably going up tomorrow as I'm slowly starting to catch this back up again. Oh, and you should start seeing grades coming in, because like I graded a whole bunch of stuff last night. Might not be a lot for you, but I graded like 50 assignments last night.